Christopher Hobbs joins us from Placerville, California tonight to present uh, Mushroom Medicine, the latest news, controversies, <clears throat> and uses. Christopher comes from a long line of botanists, but I suppose herbalist describes him best. He has many years of education, his first degree being in art history and music theory before taking a left turn later in life uh, to go into botany and earning his PhD at UC Berkeley. He is a teacher, a writer, publisher, and supplier of herbal medicines, among other things. Please welcome Christopher Hobbs. Okay, thanks, Mike. Much appreciated. <clears throat> so, great to be here with you. Thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, it's always a pleasure, and I uh, love supporting the organization. And uh, I've been out in the forest all day long today, so I was fortunate. We, I will just give you the report up, up my way in Placerville. We're up at 3,500 feet. We have some strips of tan bark oak, uh, and they are really hopping. We had so much diversity, I could not believe it. We were doing a documentary uh, and enjoyed doing that. So we did a lot of we did a lot of filming and and uh, but you know cleaning mushrooms and uh, we didn't find any boli. Well, I did. I found an edible boli one, not a porcini, and uh, a few pine boli, if you will, exinums and uh, a number. The the russel is were really out, so I got a green cap one, which I like eating. This is probably my favorite russula, uh, and I like, of course, Deliciosa is okay. It's pretty good. We found a lot of those up there, and it was li literally a, uh, a shrimp mushroom super bloom. So they're kind of coming up on the, under Doug fur just by the dozens, and maybe I saw 100 fruiting bodies up there, so they're really popping up. Uh, I eat those pretty regularly, uh, like them. And so it was just fun seeing all the swillas and all the different uh, russulas and, and all the diversity. And I think there's more to come. However, I was looking for Matsutake and we found a great patch that I knew about before. And somebody had come in with a rake and really you could see where they raked up the duff. The duff is literally uh, eight inches thick maybe deeper in some places. And you could see where they raked up the, the, uh, the duff. And I found a few fragments of Mozzies here and there. So it was a little bit too late this year, unfortunately. Timing's everything. So I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, then I'm, go oh, I'm going to get my laser pointer. Just give me one second here. Here's your pointer. And Okay, I've got this. Let me share my screen. Uh, screen one, screen two. Am I on the right screen here? I think so. Okay, and please tell me if you don't see my screen. Uh, if I don't hear from you, I presume you're seeing my, my screen here. And so I'm going to talk about tonight the health and and medical benefits of mushrooms they're more than just a pretty face they they're more than of course it's so much fun just getting out there walking in the forest enjoying the solitude sometimes of course in the nowadays in california along the coast it's not solitude is it even up here we're just getting so many people in, that are interested in mushrooms and that's a good thing to preserve the forest preserve the habitat that's a good thing but on the other hand, it's a lot harder to find sometimes porcinis and chanterelles and some other edibles. And uh, so uh, here's a, a, a beautiful picture of sugi. Uh, this is uh, this is Ganoderma sugi, but this is the East Coast one. This is the one that grows in North Carolina. The one out here, which is called Ganoderma sugi, and I've seen DNA work where, the, where both the East Coast and the West Coast one look pretty similar in the phylogeny. Uh, the one out here looks quite different. It's much, much thicker and uh, not, not quite as uh, glossy sometimes. And, and this looks like a classic Rishi 
fruiting body here, uh, makes great medicine. And Rishi is arguably uh, the the most important and and effective of all medicinal mushrooms. It certainly has the most chemical analysis on it because of all the triterpenes, all the beta glucans. It's the second highest mushroom of all in the immunomodulating beta glucan chitin complex behind turkey tail. Turkey tail is number one, containing about 60% beta glucan chitin complex, and which is the most highly immuno immuno um, stimulating, activating, modulating, and anti-inflammatory fraction of medicinal mushrooms. All medicinal mushrooms contain the beta glucan. They're cell wall polymers, glucan polymers, and <clears throat> highly branched and act as an incredibly beneficial prebiotic fiber. So turkey tail really literally are the organism that is you know, I mean, people ask me, is turkey tail edible? Well, you know, it's not exactly tender that you can enjoy just eating the fruiting bodies like you would oyster mushroom or something. But on the other hand, you can uh, put it in a pressure cooker or you could put reishi in a pressure cooker, cook it on uh, high for about 30 minutes or an hour, let it cool down for another 45 minutes until you can open the top and then blend it up. And uh, that is going to break it down very nicely so that you can utilize the, uh, of course, completely non-toxic. You can utilize that all that incredible prebiotic fiber that you find in those mushrooms, either turkey tail or reishi. And in our area, we have Ganoderma oregonense. Uh, I just found a beautiful one up, uh, up in Mendocino, nice big one on uh, I, the, ter the tree was down. I didn't think it was a hemlock. It looked more like a dug fir, but usually they grow on hemlocks, old hemlocks that are broken off, and hence the name Sugi. And uh, so I made medicine out of it, and you can either, uh, as I mentioned, break it down in the pressure cooker, which is called, uh, hot, uh, it's called basically uh, subcritical water extraction. So it uh, when you put the water under high pressure and high temperature, it can really get in, into uh, those cell walls and start breaking them down and making the beta-glucan comp uh, complex more water-soluble, more bioavailable in the upper tract to get that immunomodulating effect, increasing B cell production, increasing T memory cell production, uh, all, all of the effector cells to go out and do phagocytosis. So you're getting a lot of immune response uh, after eating these or using these. And you can make your own. Of course, there are many products out there on the market, bags of powders. Some are using fruiting body. Some are using fruity body, fruiting body plus mycelium. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some are using only mycelium. Some are producing and selling powders that are mycelium plus a lot of brown rice or other grains, which means there's going to be a lot of starch in there. And some are making tinctures. I don't really recommend tinctures because the beta glucans are, are not water soluble. They have zero solubility in, in uh, ethanol. <clears throat> so you, so that isn't, but you can do a double extraction. This is kind of like just a warm up here, but you can do a double extraction uh, by, by cooking it down in the pressure cooker, blending it up, uh, and then putting that in, in the refrigerator and cooling it for say four or five days. Meanwhile, after you press out the, the liquid and, and have just the mark, you're gonna tincture the mark in, in ethanol, say 75 to 100 to 95 proof, uh, percent ethanol, and make a tincture and then press that out. And then you're gonna blend the two liquids together and that's called a double extraction. And by the way, my book uh, shows how to make all of these types of preparations step-by-step step, uh, in, in my new book, Medicinal Mushrooms, The Essential Guide. Uh, this is it here, that's what it looks like. Um, I don't really know of the, of the uh, participants are all seasoned mushroom hunters or whether there's some beginners here. Here are some of the books that I recommend 
as guides and so forth. So you, you probably already know all this. Have you checked out Daniel Winkler's new book, Fruits of the Forest? That's a really great, great one that applies to mainly to the Northwest, but it does kind of hit Northern California as well. And uh, I think Daniel did a great job. I I'm, I'm really, really like that book. <clears throat> and the other books that you see here, all of which are, are common works. Um, so let's go into a little bit into, let's see, do, do I have an hour or an hour and a half tonight? I think it's probably up to you. Uh, okay. If you'd like to go an hour and a half, I'm sure everybody is into that. Okay, yeah, I can go an hour and a half. That's probably what it'll take me to get through everything. So right. if you leave early, that's fine, but I'll stick it out and I'll be here to cover all the slides. At the end, I'm going to go over different types of ailments and symptoms and which mushrooms to use for those ailments and symptoms. So, for, but first I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the basic uh, health benefits of eating more mushrooms, eating mushrooms every day. And uh, in my travels in Asia and China, Thailand, uh, and in Europe and other places, I've really found that in many cultures, uh, Russia, Ukraine, many people eat mushrooms every single day. And, and not only because they may, like in, for instance, in the Ukraine and in Siberia, they may be some of the only food that is really readily available, all the rusulas and milky caps and, and so forth and other mushrooms may be the predominant food that they have readily available sometime of the year, like in the fall. Uh, on the other hand, they're not just eating them for the flavor and because they have to have them for nutrition. They're eating them because they have a lot of medicinal benefits and they can help you help your immune system resist colds and flus and COVID and and, uh, and many, many other benefits, which we're going to talk about tonight. So uh, finding reliable information, I really recommend going on Google Scholar or PubMed.gov, PubMed.gov. And if you're interested, for instance, and in, well, has there been any people talk about lion's mane all the time to rebuild your brain, you know, boost up your brain and rebuild your nervous system. If you have nerve damage, it's gonna help you repair your nerve. If you have a trauma, head trauma, or you have a concussion, take lion's mane, it's really gonna help, help restore your mental faculties and so forth. So th there is a lot of talk about that and certainly a lot of advertising. And let's face it, you know, there's a lot out there on the web that is mainly just people selling products. So you have to keep, be mindful to go to pubmed.gov, which is the world's largest medical database, type in lion's mane, type in uh, nervous system or whatever, or neurogenesis, rebuilding the nerves. Uh, go ahead and put that in, 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 uh, in PubMed, and you'll get a bunch of abstracts, and you, and you can select out clinical trials only on the left, and you can see, well, how many clinical trials really have been done on lion's mane to show that if I have a concussion, it's really going to help me. Or uh, if, you know, I'm starting to lose my memory, I can't remember where my keys are or whatever, or remember what I went into the room for, then and you go, well, you know, I'm, my memory isn't as sharp as it used to be. I hear lion's mane is going to per perk up my memory, protect my memory. Well, are, what clinical trials are there on that? Or is it just mainly animal studies and and maybe quite a bit of hype, quite a bit of product sales. And unfortunately, that is the case. There are only a few uh, clinical trials on lion's mane, but I'll cover those later. Uh, another source now is ChatGPT, which actually is, uh, <clears throat> now that they've rebooted ChatGPT to 3.5, it's much more up to date. It's only a couple years out of date. And you can go on, here's, here's my search statement for ChatGPT. What is the scientific support for health benefits of lion's mane mushroom? And here's the answer. It's been used in traditional Chinese medicine for centuries. There is some scientific evidence to support the health benefits. It may have neuroprotective properties. It may help to improve cognitive function and memory. 
It may also have anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects, as well as ability to stimulate nerve growth factor. And additionally, has been shown to have potential as a natural remedy against anxiety and depression. So when you really look at the clinical trials, all you've got is anxiety and depression. There's small clinical trials showing a benefit. Most of the other studies are in vivo and in vitro. In other words, animal studies and laboratory studies. <clears throat> However, I find chat, GP, uh, chat, chat GPT very effective and very helpful, and, and, but you still have to kind of review it. So <clears throat> I may be speaking to the choir here, but after being up where the, where the, um, the Mozzies are coming up under manzanita and pines, after all, matsutake means pine mushroom. So you want to look for pines and thick, heavy duff and manzanitas growing over it. That's what we have. That's where they are in our area. They also grow under tan bark oak quite well and manzanita. Um, but you're seeing this, this, uh, this pick here. Um, Looks like some, um, well, some boletes and yeah, maybe they're all boletes here. But but it's kind of kind of robbing the cradle here, isn't it? These little tiny ones. So if you look on Facebook, you can see people like displaying on their hood, like you would a deer that they just shot, big trays of of boletes of every size, including little tiny ones. I mean, uh, we've got to exercise some, uh, a little bit of uh, wisdom about what, what we're picking, a little restraint. And uh, so I'm, I'm big on, and I've been, uh, believe me, I've been guilty of it personally myself in the past. When you start seeing Porcini, you kind of go crazy a little bit. And I understand that, but we want to avoid strip mining all of the bow leads or strip mining all of the candy caps. So always leave some and and share. I mean, if they're, if it's a well-known spot, we know very well that other people are going to be coming looking for porcini or candy caps or whatever it might be. So uh, I, I think it's good to, to exercise some restraint personally. I also think it's good to cover the holes, put the duff back, like these people that were using rakes to pull up the duff to find the, the uh, Matsutakis, they just pulled it up and they left it open. So for, for God's sakes, you know, cover it up uh, so that the, the mycelium doesn't all grow, uh, all dry out and it just messes up the habitat. Uh, use of rakes, I'm not big on use, using rakes to pull up the duff. Um, and if you're picking polypores like Rishi, try to leave a polypore or two fruiting body so that it can send those trillions of spores out. Don't pull them all off the tree. And remember that the animals eat a lot of uh, these mushrooms as well. So just a little restraint. And also, I, again, I might be preaching to the choir here, but don't forget about your, if you're a beginner, don't forget about being really sure of your, <coughs> of your uh, identity. Here is a picture that I saw in uh, Chicago Parent, it was on the web. And here's a bunch of kids supposedly holding chanterelles. Uh, their parents are in another chain showing them the mushrooms. And here, and so all I can say is, oops, these are all jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, which are toxic. And here are the, here are the kids holding these jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, thinking they're chanterelles. They, they may be the same color, but that's where the, where the similarity stops. And so, you know, make sure, especially if you're showing your kids that you know what you're picking. I, again, I may be preaching everybody to the choir here, but, but uh, it's so important, especially when you're, you're Manita Calyptoderma or, or some of the Rusulas, make sure to taste them and make sure they're, they're uh, you know, I, I'm a big Rusula fan. I've been picking a lot of Rusulas lately, getting more into them, grilling them. They're really among the best. And, when you can't find porcini or 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 uh, and you or you can't find uh, uh, chanterelles or candy caps or some of the really you know, favorite ones or mozzies, then go for the rusulas. I mean, the rusulas are abundant. Uh, the greens, the green capped ones are are great. I, I really enjoy eating those. 
the texture is good. It's even better than the delicious Milky Cap, in my opinion. And you always make sure to taste it in case you didn't know. Just take a piece of the flesh like this and put it in your mouth and smack on it, taste it. If it's real acrid, if it's very acrid, just spit it out, rinse your mouth out if you want. Um, but the green capped one is just sweet and nutty. Uh, that's what I've noticed. At least this one that we have up here is so sweet and nutty. And I just love grilling them. And they are, they're really delicious. Put a little sauce on there with some tamari, olive oil, uh, maybe some garlic. And wow, they are butter if you prefer. And they, they're really good as far as I'm concerned. And boy, they were, there was a super bloom of these up there. And then the shrimps. We had a super bloom of shrimps up there. And I like those. I've been eating those the last few days. You know, no bow leaves where, where I am, but we have lots of roostless. <clears throat> so, again, harvesting should be very, done very carefully. And, again, eat more mushrooms. They, they are so healthy. Uh, they're safe. They have medicinal benefits, which I'm going to go more into here. But, um, you know, grow your own. Uh, harvest them in the wild, cook them and dry them, just dry them if it's porcini, get a food dehydrator, get that running with, with the candy caps and the porcini slices or whatever, and, uh, and just eat more mushrooms. I think wood ear is really good. If you happen to live in the Bay Area, go over to Berkeley Bowl or Monterey Market. They have wood ear. They have every kind of fresh uh, medicinal and edible mushroom that you can find. It's really a treat to go over to the Berkeley Bowl or over to uh, Monterey Mushrooms. They have, it's just so fun to walk down the aisle, see all these dried mushrooms, fresh mushrooms, and, uh, and try some new ones, try some new ones. <clears throat> so the transformative power of mushrooms. Mushrooms can really, are, are something, uh, so many people are turning on to mushrooms right now for many reasons, especially young people. I know a lot of young people that it's on TikTok. My son says, oh, my, uh, my friend saw your TikTok uh, on mushrooms and was really interested. So there are a lot of people on Instagram, TikTok. By the way, you can follow me on Instagram. I have Instagram Reels. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook. You can follow me on YouTube. But um, uh, so a lot of people are, especially young people, are really turning on to mushrooms, and for good reason. For one thing, we're <coughs> world pollu pollution and water. It takes so much more water. <coughs> There's more pollution created when you're creating and 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 heart and growing and cultivating animal products. It's it, especially uh, beef and so forth. Beef is so inefficient when you compare it with mushrooms. How much protein you can get. Remember that mushrooms are have really high quality protein in them. They have super high quality protein up to 30 percent or maybe a little bit higher in some mushrooms like oyster mushrooms, certain species. And, and uh, so it's just a great protein source, vitamins, minerals, B vitamins, I, uh, uh, trace minerals, copper, zinc, one of the greatest sources, <coughs> uh, fatty acids uh, that we need, linolenic and linoleic acid, uh, fatty acids. And, and then again, prebiotic fiber that is second to none, that is the best prebiotic fiber source in the world. There's all this new information about the microbiome and, and its benefits for health. So promote your microbiome, feed your microbiome, eat more mushrooms. So I'm a, I'm a big proponent of just adding them to our diet as much as possible. And, and it's a great way to phase out of a pr predominantly animal-based product to a mainly plant-based, well, of course, they're not plants, but plant mushroom-based diet. And there is new evidence coming out all the time. I'm a big fan, I'm a scientist. I go into the literature, constantly in the literature, and the, re the recent, uh, recent study, even the most recent studies are showing that a plant-based diet is really the way to go for longevity. And we don't need as much protein as we think we do. And for protecting your kidneys, protecting your liver, you do not want to get up 
to uh, 70, 80, 90, 120 grams of protein a day, which many people get. They get up to 150 grams of protein a day. You're eating a hamburger and a steak, uh, some chicken uh, every day. You're going to be getting up to 150 grams of protein. That's very hard. Yeah, and you think, well, I can build more muscle that way. I build muscle fine in the gym, just eating my plant-based diet, frankly. I eat a lot of legumes, which are good protein source. I eat a lot of mushrooms. I, I take uh, pea, pea powder, pea protein powder, mushroom protein powder, and I get plenty of protein. I get 40 to 50 grams per day, and my kidneys and liver thank me because uh, all that protein, breaking that down, that's, that is hard on the kidneys and the liver. And so new research over and over again is showing that a plant-based, mostly plant-based diet, I'm not saying don't eat animal products. You can still have your eggs and chicken and fish and so forth. Uh, however, just be moderate. Just be moderate and try to add more plant-based, mushroom-based products in there. So uh, world pollution, we're going to cut, cut way back on world pollution if we grow more mushrooms and less animal products. And again, the fiber is so important. All of these other anti-inflammatory products in mushrooms like phenolics and terpenes and so forth. Uh, meat production is just really inefficient and that's a big advantage of growing edible fungi. And you go into Indonesia, they are cultivating uh, split gill, schizophyllum, communi. They're growing it. They're growing like a lot of it because it's so high in protein, it tastes meaty, they're crushing it, they're putting it with fish sauce in there, and they're eating schizophyllum. They're eating a lot of it in their dishes. They're making loaves out of it, they're making steaks out of it, all kinds of things. So, uh, and, and they're growing a lot of oyster mushrooms. I mean, in Indonesia, it's so raining all the time, all you need is some straw, some biomass. It's raining, you inoculate it, and you're gonna get oyster mushrooms, high in protein high in vitamins and minerals. So you're, you're getting a lot of people that are just eating so many mushrooms and cultivating so many mushrooms. Um, and here's one study that shows that where, where they gave some people some, some meat products and they gave the other group some mushroom products to look that looks like meat. Here's, let me see. Here, here uh, for instance, is it meat or mushrooms? There are some companies that are producing um, producing meat products that look so much like, like, um, uh, or they're growing mushroom products that look so much like meat. And here's some, here's some, uh, here's a company, Meaty, uh, and they got whole cut steak and chicken products, uh, jerky strips, all made out of mushrooms. So, um, let me go back to where I was here. Uh, so, um, let's see, um, so this one study showed that, that the, the one group that got the edible fungi that looks like meat and the other group that got the meat, actually the people that ate the fungi were satiated earlier. They felt more, they, they felt more satisfied with the meal that they had than the people that were getting the meat. So that was kind of an interesting study. Uh, nutritional profiles of mushrooms compared favorably with animal products. They've got the B vitamins, they've got fatty acids, they've got vitamins, minerals, trace minerals, uh, and, and they've got fiber. And remember that animal products have zero fiber. Eggs, meat, chicken, uh, milk, dairy products, zero fiber. If you get more fiber, if you get your fiber up higher, then you're gonna live longer. That's, that's just a statistical and scientific fact. Could be that you've got great genes and you can eat a steak a day and not get any fiber and still live to be 100 is possible. But uh, if you want to play the odds, then you're going to get a higher plant-based diet. <clears throat> okay, and then there's psilocybin mushrooms out there too, which certainly are getting to be transformative. <clears throat> and many people are interested in psilocybin mushrooms for transforming, for looking at early trauma and transforming that and so forth. So I'm not going to go into that in this particular talk. Uh, so, that, so again, why meat, eat mushrooms daily? Here they are enjoying some enoki mushrooms, fatty acids, high quality protein, fiber, B vitamins. The, the mushrooms have 
uh, rival meat in their quantity of B vitamins. No other food in, in, in the produce uh, counter has as many B vitamins as mushrooms. Vitamin D. <clears throat> um, I know some mushroom companies that grow button mushrooms. They run them through uh, a conveyor belt like this and they irradiate them with ultraviolet light. The mushrooms start producing high quantities of vitamin D. It is vitamin D2, but, it, but it, you can get a lot of vitamin D2, which isn't quite as well absorbed as D3, but it's okay. You're still getting a lot. You could have a serving of shiitake that's been exposed to the sun. When you get shiitake, just put it outside. For, for maybe a half hour, and it's going to produce all this vitamin D. Well, you're going to get 890 to 1,000, over 1,000 IUs of vitamin D just in your, which is going to be your daily requirement, just in a serving of shiitake or button mushrooms that have been exposed to, to um, the sunlight. They're, and besides, they're delicious. Grilling them, and putting them on, slicing them on, putting on pizza. If you don't like cheese and flour, then you can do a cauliflower crust. You can buy cauliflower crust, crust nowadays. I've done that. You don't like cheese, put pesto on it. And then bake it and whatever, put lots of mushrooms on it. Pasta goes really well. Here's lobster mushroom and pasta. We just had this dish. I was up at Mendo and I found a great big lobster mushroom. We cut it up and we, we put some greens in it, some, some herbs, and we cut it up like this. It was delicious. It was really, I don't know if you've had lobster mushrooms, but we really enjoyed them, and you're getting lots of fiber again. They're really loaded with fiber. Forest therapy, I mean, just being out there in the forest today, I, was, I felt so good, I felt so calm, so peaceful. I was so happy to be out there, and <clears throat> The trees really are producing literally tons of gases that contain monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, even some diterpenes that are known to be very calming to the nervous system. And also phenolics that have an antioxidant effect. So when we're going out in the forest, we're actually getting these vaporized compounds that we're breathing in. That's that pine scent or the the, really the scent of the being in the forest. You're getting all of these calming compounds. That's one reason why forest therapy works. You're going out there and you're inhaling these monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes that are proven to have a calming effect on our nervous system. So when you smell that pine, pine scent or forest scent and you go, ah, I just feel so relaxed. Well, that's one reason why. Probably not the only reason, but it certainly is one reason. Again, me, uh, a lot of meat products out there. Have you ever had? I, recently, I've been in restaurants when I was traveling uh, downtown San Francisco. Uh, I, I'm doing a course down there and uh, in the East Coast. And the, the restaurant only had, the only thing they had that I really wanted to eat was a, was a, a Beyond Meat burger, which is pretty juicy and pretty tender. And then you could put all the vegetables that you want on there, tomato and lettuce and so forth. And uh, I, I kind of enjoyed that, actually. And here's, here's another, here's some mushroom steaks, literally made out of, uh, out of mushrooms. Of course, portobellos you can grill, uh, but they're actually making steaks out of mushrooms now. Remember that, that, um, Many of the medicinal mushrooms are also food. So it really is a medicinal food. Uh, you can cook and, and even things like turkey tails, reishi, uh, other hard conks like, like um, uh, birch polypore. All of those can be put, put into a pressure cooker and cooked on, under subcritical water extraction that really breaks them down and then blend them and you can put that in soups if you want to thicken it and put that mushroom in there, like turkey tail or reishi. Reishi can be bitter. Some uh, species of reishi are quite bitter. Some of the tri triterpenes are fairly bitter. So, uh, but turkey tail has a very nice mushroomy flavor 
and it's no problem at all. Put your turkey tails in there, break them down to a, to a kind of creamy uh, or to a thick liquid <clears throat> in your pressure cooker, then blend them up until they're kind of creamy. Uh, and you can keep that in the refrigerator. You could freeze it in ice cube trays and then go ahead and just put one or two of the ice cubes of the frozen mushroom slurry uh, that's been well cooked in your soups. Uh, so that's one way to use it. You can also add 25% ethanol and just keep it indefinitely and take one tablespoon at a time to get your, your immune boost or whatever, anti-cancer effect uh, during the cold and flu season, for instance. And um, so that's, and that's also, again, a great way to, to add more nutrition to your diet and more more uh, microbiome friendly foods and it's healthy for the planet it's much more healthy for the planet to grow mushrooms I mean, it breaks breaks down the biomass and it creates this wonderful food and has also mushrooms have when especially when it's roasted or grilled has a really good umami taste like kind of simulates mushrooms again the mushroom i mean meat flavor high in quality protein, high in B vitamins. And check the China study out. China study is one of the, one of the best uh, books. There's a new version of it out, really extolling the virtue of a plant-based diet for longevity, for getting rid of all kinds of uh, ailments like autoimmune conditions, arthritis, lupus, and so forth, uh, while at the same time cites a lot of literature to kind of give that convincing uh, aspect to it. Now again, uh, mushroom fiber is so important. Uh, probably the single most uh, large benefit that you're getting out of eating mushrooms is just the prebiotic fiber. The average person in, in the United States and also in Europe only gets around 15 grams of prebiotic fiber per day. The government recommends 25 grams a day for optimum health. And if you're on a traditional diet, like if you're living out in the forest or you're living in a traditional place where there's not a lot of processed food, you will get around 40 to 50 grams of prebiotic fiber a day. Getting that much uh, fiber in your diet, you, you can literally cut your risk of cancer and heart disease in half. It's really a strong statement, but there's research that actually show that. And remember that by feeding your microbiome, you may not be aware of it, but 80% of our serotonin, which is a very important neurotransmitter that regulates our vessel size and our blood flow, it regulates sexual activity and sexuality, it regulates our sleep, uh, it regulates our mood. We need lots of serotonin and, uh, in our body, a normal amount. And as we age, we may not pr produce as much serotonin. So 80% of our body serotonin is produced by gut microflora. That's, uh, that's such an amazing, I never knew that up until a couple of years ago, but our, our, the, much of our serotonin in our body, I thought it was always produced in the nervous system, it's not. It's produced by our microflora. And also about half of our dopamine, our feel-good hormone, about half of our dopamine and 80% of our serotonin is produced by the microflora in our gut. And the more prebiotic fiber we get, the more diversity we get in our microflora, that leads to a better immune response, leads to more neurotransmitters and and also the most beneficial species are promoted. So this in itself is literally the single most important reason to eat mushrooms regularly, if not daily. Legumes turn out to be the second most, uh, the second highest food in prebiotic fiber is all kinds of legumes, lentil soup, on and on. Um, and mushroom fiber is the perfect combination of soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. We need both types of fiber. Oats are a great source of fiber, but they can't even come close. I eat oats almost every day for breakfast, 
and I have them raw in muesli, but with nuts and fruit. And I think it is a health supplement, personally. <clears throat> I put lots of berries on it, but, but uh, really, uh, <clears throat> or you could put some huckleberries on it if you're out there in the forest, uh, out there up in Mendocino. But <clears throat> I've just found that mushroom fiber in doing all the research I've done is really much, much greater prebiotic fiber than any other food, really, except legumes or a close second, sometimes a distant second. <sighs> so here's, here's another kind of um, statement about why fiber is so important. All the legumes, all the mushrooms. If, if, you're, if you're having lentil soup frequently, be all kinds of beans, chili, whatever, and, and lots of legumes throughout the week and lots of mushrooms, lots of greens. I mean, you're, you're good. You're good. You're going to live to be 100 years old uh, if you've got some, hopefully you've got some good genes and not under super high stress, but, or don't step in front of a truck or something. But you, the, the chances are you're going to live a lot longer, healthier life. And here's a meta-analysis that looked at 12 studies with at least a three-year follow-up a significantly lower risk of 9% was seen for both cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease with every additional seven grams a day of to total fiber. That is basically four or five medium-sized shiitakes. You can almost 10% less risk of cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular uh, vascular disease and coronary, coronary heart disease with every four or five shiitakes you're eating. So, well, how can you go wrong? They're delicious too. Um, I put three medium shiitakes, it depends on the size, so between three and four uh, shiitakes. One portion of whole grains plus a portion of beans and lentils or legumes, uh, some vegetables and fruit, uh, nuts and seeds, and that is, frankly, I have uh, healthy aging, I follow it, assiduously and i'm also a uh, literally a, a, a i walk the walk i don't i'm not just talking about this i walk the walk i walk the talk and uh, my cardiovascular figures are incredible i can still backpack i still go up in desolation and backpack uh, i'm still flexible completely flexible i have no aches or pains and uh, and this has been this is my diet this is my diet for the last really 20 years and i've been a vegetarian for uh, 50 years but but i've really clean i've really gotten my diet down the last i'd say 20 years 20 30 years and 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 uh, so i can i can tell you from my own medical uh tests that i get every year and from how i feel that that uh, i'm i'm much younger uh, than than my age my chronological my chronological age and it is possible. So here is the, here's a chart showing the reduction in risk uh, in heart disease. It, here is 15 grams a day. That's, a, that's the average risk for heart disease. And that's not saying much, is it? Because mo um, card cardiovascular disease is the number one killer still. So a lot of people have cardiovascular disease. So I'd say a normal risk is not really saying a whole lot. But if you, if you get only like a little bit of fiber in your diet, you're gonna be one and a half times more likely to have cardiovascular disease than the average person. However, here you are getting 50 grams, 60 grams, that means no processed food, that means a lot of legumes, that means a lot of mushrooms. You're gonna basically, your, your, your risk of cardiovascular disease is really going to be significantly lower. Achieving 50 grams of fiber a day. Here's my diet here. This is taken out of my diet. One cook of cup, uh, cooked legumes, lentils, split peas, red kidney beans, whatever. Um, whole grains, buckwheat, brown rice, barley rice, quinoa, whatever you like. One and a half cup of oats, muesli in the morning. That's what my pretty much my breakfast is. Three meat. I have eggs occasionally though. Uh, I think it's good to have a, a varied diet. It's important to have a varied diet. 
uh, three medium-sized shiitakes, one cup cooked, uh, cooked broccoli or, or green vegetables, two or three cups of salad, dark green vegetables, root vegetables, yams, nuts and seeds, medium apple, here you go, 50 grams of fiber per day, 40 to 50. Um, so you can get up to 60 if you're eating no processed foods, traditional diet, but mine's around 40 to 50. And I, I, I think that's, that's good enough for me, along with the exercise. And the latest research, by the way, I'll just sneak this in as a sidebar. The latest study looked at like 150,000 people. They pooled all this data. I just read this the other day. And, you know, we all hear the 10,000 steps is the, the, is the optimum amount of walking per day to cut our risk of, of all, uh, our risk of death from all causes and also cardiovascular disease and diabetes and so forth and obesity. Uh, so 10,000 steps is what they say. This new study that pooled data from over 150,000 people over 10 years or 20 years, something like that, fantastically big one, showed that there's still benefits up to, up to literally uh, 20,000 steps a day. But the, the, the main benefits start at around 7,000 steps a day. That's about three miles and goes up to around 15,000. So between, between seven and 15,000, that's when all the benefits really start to accumulate. It kind of flattens out at the top. Not worth going over 15. I don't think really you're not going to get that much more benefit. <clears throat> but it really is worth the trouble to get up to seven thousand if you can at least five per day i've got a ring here that, that the hour ring that shows me how many i'm getting per day and of course i've got my health app here i'm pretty big at just uh, making myself accountable for that for taking the time uh, and i've also got a treadmill desk here which i use and when i'm working and doing email and stuff so i think I th that's uh, that's longevity and health in a nutshell right there and mushrooms are a big part of that now the main medicinal components let's get on to the medicinal part of mushrooms and so the main medicinal components are the triple helix beta glucan and these are chains of glucose molecules that are highly branched and <clears throat> again this is the fiber but uh, beta-glucan is complex tightly with another amino glycan, uh, a glucan, which is called chitin. And chitin is the tough uh, material that's in crab shells, very, very tough that's found in crab shells. And uh, so it's very, very tough and it's complex with the beta-glucans. So that's why you have to cook mushrooms. You have to cook, most, mostly you have to cook all mushrooms to get the benefits out of them to get the nutrition out, the medicinal effects. Because only about 20% of the beta-glucan, beta-glucans, which are the most proven amino modulating and boosting um, uh, component of mushrooms, uh, you only get about 20% of the benefit when you, when you lightly cook mushrooms. When you put them in a pressure cooker, then you're gonna get around 50% to 60%. So that's why I'm a big fan of pressure cooking. Uh, now, that, that's only the tougher ones. When you talk about uh, oyster mushrooms, maitake, uh, lion's mane, shiitake, you don't have to cook those. As, you don't have to cook those in a pressure cooker. You just have to stir fry them until they're tender. And you're going to get more, you're going to get around 50% of the beta-glucan out of that. Shiitake is a very good source of beta-glucan. It's around... Uh, what 30 percent something like that but again reishi 50 percent at most and turkey tail 60 percent beta glucans uh, that's why they're the most valuable mushroom out there in the forest and if you find a big turkey tail log that is a that's really a, a, a big benefit i would take off half the turkey tail put them in a pressure cooker turn them into a slurry like i have in my book or a powder Add that to your soups, add it to your stir fries, uh, and it tastes good. It's got a nice mushroomy flavor, and you're getting so many benefits. Uh, but you're also getting, besides the beta-glucans, 
besides the beta-glucans, you're getting also a lot of terpenes, like the diterpenes in lion's mane, the triterpenes in reishi, which have an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, again, an, an immunomodulating effect, hepatoprotective, so many benefits to the uh, terpenes and the, di the diterpenes, the triterpenes, and, uh, and the other uh, phenolic compounds, which are found in in mushrooms. Now, one thing you might not have known, you know, people are eating, they're saying eat a lot of berries, uh, drink green tea to get phenolics, uh, drink pomegranate juice to get phenolic compounds that are going to lead to longevity, protect your cardiovascular system, uh, because those are the highest. And you even maybe heard of pycnogenol, which is pine bark extract that has a lot of these uh, phenolic compounds that that have a really beneficial effect and antioxidant effect on the body. Well, it turns out mushrooms are higher in these antioxidant, anti uh, compounds than, than pomegranate juice, than elderberry juice, than green tea. Mushrooms. Mushrooms contain a higher level of phenolics than any of these famous antioxidant foods. So that's something that I, I didn't really tune in to, into until maybe a year and a half, two years ago. But now I've really looked at the literature and it's pretty phenomenal uh, how many phenolic, antioxidant phenolic compounds you're getting in mushrooms. <clears throat> now the biological activities of fungi, here are these beta-glucans. Uh, they're long chains, they're highly branched. Yeah. Oh, I can leave. Huh? Somebody unmuted there. Um, so I'll go on here. The, so these complex molecules are highly immunogenic. They hit certain uh, receptor sites on our macrophages as they go down through the gut, you get actually a double immune activation from mushrooms. First of all, if you cook them and break it down, they're going to start interacting with, you know, 60% of our immune tissue is in our upper gut. So as the mushrooms go down, you're going to start interacting with these special cells called M cells. You're going to get a lot of immune activation. The, the macrophages, and this is in my book, I have a chart in there showing how it works. The, the um, macrophages will start phagocytizing these beta-glucans, breaking them down, potentizing them, sending them over to uh, these other special cells uh, that are immune regulators. So they regulate the B cell production for antibodies. They regulate the T memory cells so we can remember COVID for several years. So if you're ever going to get uh, a, a vaccine against COVID, cold and flu season, COVID season may be coming up, we don't know. Uh, but if you're gonna get a vaccine, I recommend doing some reishi powder every day, about two or three grams per day in the morning uh, to really get your immune system revved up so you get a stronger production of antibodies, you're going to get a stronger production of T memory cells to remember that COVID uh, uh, spike protein for much longer, maybe for years. And that's why my, um, viruses almost always go down in, in, in uh, virulence because we eventually, even though the antibodies only last six months to a year, uh, even after a vaccine, even after being infected, you probably know you can be infected two or three times. Uh, I know people that have been infected three times. Uh, so the antibodies only really last for six months to a year, maybe even sometimes less. Uh, you get more, you get stronger antibodies, obviously, from getting the infection than you do from the vaccine because you're getting all of those different proteins on the virus, not just the spike protein. So that makes sense. But, but use your medicinal mushrooms first and then get your vaccine if you're going to. Or if you don't want to get a vaccine, you can pretty much ramp up your, your immune system 
to recognize flu viruses, cold viruses, and really go after them quickly. You're gonna get a quicker response, longer lasting response, and a more powerful response, according to a lot of literature out there. So anyway, we know how they work. We know the molecular uh, circuitry that goes on, the pathways, the immune pathways. We, we're very clear on what happens. Here's the triple helix. They, these um, beta-glucans form triple helix for more flexibility in the cell walls. Here is, here's the chitin beta-glucans right here going down the pike through our small intestine. Here are the macrophages that are swarming around here, these special immune cells called Peyer's patches and the M cells. They, they engulf the uh, beta-glucans and chitins. The macrophage breaks those down, produces particles right here that you're seeing that activates mast cells, activates other uh, neutrophils, monocytes, phagocytes, natural killer cells, and also activate dendritic cells to pump up our T cell production, uh, cytotoxic T cells, T memory cells, and also pumping up our B cell production or our antibody production. Here are the antibodies, the B cells produce the antibodies. So we, you can see that you're getting this widespread, really profound effect from these mushroom molecules. And why is that? Why, why have we learned over evolutionary time to recognize them? That is really interesting, isn't it? How, why do we get that kind of immune response from them? Well, uh, one thought is that, of course, our body had to learn to recognize fungi because in the old days, before we had antifungals, uh, a fungal infection could be life-threatening. So some fungi are very pathogenic, molds, uh, certain molds and so forth uh, can be very pathogenic. Uh, and you've got toenail fungus and ringworm, things like that, which can cause a skin lesion last for years, but it can also get a lot more serious than that. And if you get any kind of stress and immune suppression and you get a fungal infection uh, in your lungs or something or your sinuses, like if you've ever had a sinus infection that wouldn't clear up from antibiotics, it's probably a fungal infection. It's probably a mold infection in your sinuses. This can get out of hand if we have a weakened immunity. So uh, we think that maybe is why we learn to recognize these compounds. On the other hand, um, as we know, the edible fungi, the higher fungi are not dangerous. They're not going to cause an infection unless you're really severely immunocompromised, something like schizophilum can cause a, an infection and overgrowth in the lungs. That's been shown. Uh, but otherwise, they, they're non, completely non-toxic and they're very beneficial. But they still have those same beta-glucan compounds that are immunomodulating. So here is the beta-glucan content of wild mushrooms. More beta-glucan, the better. That's the prebiotic fiber. You notice that button mushrooms are quite low, 8.6%. That's about as low as you get. That's one another reason for, for dumping the button mushrooms and going for the shiitake or oyster. Here's shiitake. The stalk is usually has more. It's more fibrous than the cap. So say about 20, 22, 25% along in there. That's a good amount of beta-glucan. Then you have the oyster mushroom. The cap's got about 25% uh, uh, prebiotic fiber, uh, beta-glucan. Chanterelles are really pretty high. Honey mushroom, look at that. Honey mushroom contains almost 39% beta-glucans. That's really, I mean, I eat honey mushrooms. I don't know how many of you are, are yeah, yeah, eat uh, fun, uh, uh, honey mushrooms, but I'll eat them, especially in the button form, I like them. Some people do get, uh, do react to them. Uh, I, one time I cooked up uh, honey mushrooms for a group of 30 people, and out of that 30 people, two people had digestive upset. So uh, it's not as common, it can happen. Uh, look at this, the stock, don't throw your porcini stocks away. 
If you find a porcini, the stock has up to 58% beta-glucan prebiotic fiber and the cap only 17%. Here's the turkey tail, 61%. Maitake, 26%. Tinder fungus, 22%. Wood ears, 40, 42 <clears throat> Wood ears are a great source of prebiotic fiber. Wood ears. And they also regulate the blood sugar. <clears throat> um, Reishi up to 54%. Here are the references, by the way, if you want to look them up on Google Scholar. The most clinically relevant medicinal mushrooms are shiitake, turkey tail, reishi, maitake, lion's mane, uh, fulang or holan, which is Wolfaporia cocos. It's a, two, it's a sclerotium of a polypore mushroom <clears throat> that kind of looks like a coconut. It's got a black skin on it and it's white inside, kind of looks like, reminds you of a coconut. That's why they call it, they used to call it, well, they call it Wolfaporia cocos. Uh, Pleurotus mushroom, oyster mushroom is used for regulating cholesterol. Cordyceps is a very famous medicinal. Uh, other species are Agaricus blasii. Uh, so that's uh, sun agaric. Some people call it, that's one trade name. This has a lot of research behind it. Tremella fusiformis, which is the wood, which is uh, witch's butter. That has a lot of beta-glucan in it and uh, the good old chaga in a notice obliquous. So here are the best edibles. Here's, here's a beautiful lion's mane. Uh, they are always wonderful to find. They taste good. You can make steaks out of them and they taste really good. The wood ear, I'm a big wood ear fan. <clears throat> I put it in my soups with cabbage and spices, maybe a little fish sauce, uh, maybe some tofu, whatever you like in there. and the wood ear, I find it's a little bit crunchy, but it's very good for regulating blood sugar, good for benefiting the lungs during cold and flu season. Uh, widely used throughout Asia. When I was uh, working in a hospital in Hangzhou, China, I lived in Hangzhou, China and worked in a hospital there. And I went into the restaurant and they, they, uh, everybody was eating wood ear and other mushrooms in their dish every day. And uh, I had, I never could get the tones right, but I wanted more wood ears. So I had my teacher, my Chinese teacher, write out in, in uh, you know, the, the lettering, the Chinese words, um, uh, figures, uh, please put more wood ear in my soup. So I just held the card up so that I could get more wood ear in my soup because I loved it so much. Really crunchy and good. Some possible indications. Here are some of the major indications. Shiitake for immune weakness. You can eat the mushrooms. You can make a slurry like I talked about. <clears throat> you can make a double extraction. You can make a dried powder, add it to your soups and so forth. Uh, I like cooking with it. I love shiitake. For preventing infections, there are some studies. And there are lots of studies on shiitake for preventing and treating uh, or as a, as a part of treatment to a natural treatment for cancer. <clears throat> so there are many, many clinical studies on shiitake and turkey tail. Those are the two that are, have really been studied for in clinical trials where one group gets the chemo, one group gets the chemo plus the, the uh, turkey tail or shiitake extract, and they find that people uh, that are getting the chemotherapy along with a mushroom extract, has, a, has up to a 30% higher five-year survival rate, has lower side effects from the chemo, such as nausea and hair loss, and also much stronger immune response. Such so important for, uh, for cancer. It's so important to have a good, maintain a good immune response, and the chemo really trashes our immune system right at the bone marrow level. So uh, it's, a, it's a rather brutal treatment, and, and, uh, but always take, always take turkey tail and reshoot with it. Uh, for viral syndromes, hepatitis, herpes, HIV, there are studies showing bolstering of the immune system to go after viruses. So certainly throughout cold and flu season, I'm a big fan of reishi every morning. 
Sometimes I'll mix it up and put turkey tail in there. Cordyceps for fatigue, for increasing performance, as an adaptogen to counteract stress, as an anti-aging supplement, uh, for sexual potency. These are the things that they were used in traditional med medicine for in the culture. The, the fruiting body, I'm going to show you a fruiting body, I think, coming up here. Uh, they look like a, they, they're very phallic, so that may be where they got that in traditional medicine. Rishi for insomnia, anxiety, nervous system disorders related to stress. Rishi is just the number one medicinal that, that uh, I take every morning, especially during the cold and flu season. And Rishi for respiratory problems of any kind, whether it be chronic respiratory problems like like COPD or, bron or chronic bronchitis or any kind. And Rishi for benefiting the cardiovascular system. Uh, long been thought of for benefiting the cardiovascular system. <clears throat> Here are the top cultivated mushrooms, and all of these are medicinal, remember. Um, we know all these, but the clamshell, the beech mushroom, brown beech, uh, or shimiji, uh, comes in brown and white. The king oyster, wood ear, enoki is very good. Tea tree mushroom, chicken leg mushroom. So there, there are ones that you can find in, in, uh, in Monterey mushrooms or, or at Berkeley Bowl. You can find all of these there and, and try them out. Now products, let's talk products for, for a minute here. <clears throat> We've got about 20 minutes. I wanna save a little time for questions if there are any. Um, Products, again, it's very important that you don't get products that have a high level of starch. Fortunately, there is a DIY starch test that, that is widely available that you can get. All you need is a bottle of iodine solution. Uh, I, I use, uh, let's see, it's called Lugol, L-U-G-O-L, -L, Lugol solution. You put, you, you put your powder or extract of your mushroom powder in a little water and put five drops of the iodine solution in there. If it turns bright blue, I think I may have a slide coming up, if it turns bright blue, it's got significant starch. This is a very time-honored starch test. So you don't want a lot of starch in your mushroom. If you take uh, get a, a lion's mane product, a bag, and you put it in water and stir it up and dissolve it, put your iodine solution in there, turns bright blue, stays bright blue. It's probably got 50% starch in there. They didn't let the mycelium digest all of the substrate and turn it into mycelium. And they didn't wait and produce fruiting bodies. So if you, obviously, if you make a, a product out of fruiting bodies of lions mean only, it's not gonna turn blue. It's just gonna stay amber colored like the original extract. So you can make a double extraction, kind of a trade-off, but you get more of the phenolics and terpenes plus the beta-glucans, and it's in convenient form, the liquid form. <laughs> Cooking and eating mushrooms will provide all of the benefits of any, uh, any medicine, because you're eating the whole mushroom, like if you're eating shiitake or lion's mane or whatever, just eat the whole mushroom. That's a great way to capture. You don't have to buy the, the, the powder. But you can certainly make your own powder, make your own liquids. I tell how to do it step by step in my book. And that's going to be a lot cheaper because you can buy, <clears throat> if you buy the ones that are very concentrated, say lion's mane or turkey tail, it's $30 a bag for powder uh, for um, 1.8 ounces. That's really expensive. So you can make your own for a fraction of that cost if you wanted to take a few hours and if you're using it a lot, just make your own powder. Um, water extraction is by far the best to capture all the compounds in there, as well as the fiber and nutrition. Because you're gonna put the turkey tail, you're gonna put the reishi in the pressure cooker, break it down, blend it up to a slurry, uh, put and tell it, and simmer it down till it's thick, put it into a food, the fruit leather trays of a food dehydrator, dehydrate it till it's really dry and crispy, break that those wafers up, put it into a coffee grinder, grind it down to a fine powder. I know that's not easy to remember all those steps. I'm just telling, just mentioning how easy it is 
to make it. And I do it step by step with pictures in my book again. You can make your own powder, make a, a whole quart jar of your powder. I mean, that, that's, you tried to buy that, uh, that that's going to be like hundreds of dollars worth of, uh, worth of medicine. Um, so I did that already. Let's see, sourcing mushrooms, <coughs> forays and wild crafting, obviously direct from growers like uh, far west fungi sell a lot of reishi fruiting bodies organically grown they sell shiitakes they sell lion's mane you can make your own products if you don't want to grow your own just buy them from far west fungi or remember that if you want to make shiitake extracts or slurries you can buy organic shiitake that is in broken pieces so you don't they don't have to be beautiful you're going to be boiling them down and making medicine. So I buy I buy one pound bags of organic shiitake seconds that are all broken up. I don't care. I'm just going to make medicine out of it. They don't have to look good. You can grow your own on straw. You can grow your own, grow your own on wood, and so forth. So eight. Let's just go through this really quickly here. Maybe maybe five ten minutes. Then I'll, I'll take some questions if you have any. Uh, slowing down aging. We've got <coughs> chaga here, <coughs> certainly is used for anti-aging. Rishi is certainly one of the very best. There's rishi here, some gorgeous rishis that I took a picture of in <coughs> near Philadelphia. Turkey tail is just so valuable, loaded with beta-glucans, terpenes, and phenolics. Here is cordyceps militaris, which uh, you can buy, you can cook with it, you can make medicine. Buy it from Far West Fungi. You can buy it by the bag, probably. Um, get the whole fruiting bodies like this and make your own medicine. It's fantastic. And here is, excuse me, here is the lion's mane. Here's a baby lion's mane coming out on a tan bark oak log, uh, which I harvested. Just uh, delicious to, to stir fry it up. Um, so, fun. So for anti-aging, you want Fungi with strong anti-inflammatory properties and antioxidant properties because research clearly shows that inflammation is intimately linked and antioxidants, uh, pro-oxidation in the body is really closely linked with aging, getting wrinkles, um, your cells starting to wear down. Uh, so, so we want really good anti-inflammatory foods and we want antioxidant foods and that's going to be reishi it's going to be jerky tails you're going to have a lot in there um, cordyceps militaris promotes active energy in the body uh, which may be useful as when we're older chaga is the most powerful of all mushroom antioxidants it's chaga Oh, we already did that. Um, oh, huh. here's a here's a video of the of the reishi mushrooms. This is Ganoderma lucidum. That doesn't grow native here. It may have gotten started here, or maybe it's actually beautiful mushrooms. Now, antioxidant power. You're going to go for chaga. Number one, you're going to go for honey mushrooms. You can make an you can make a double extraction out of honey mushrooms. Aren't they beautiful? These are also just in prime prime shape. You can eat them. <coughs> Fu Ling, uh, which is the the sclerotium from a polypore mushroom, you can buy it in Chinese herb stores. You can buy you can just get mycelium products. Reishi uh, jelly mushrooms such as the wood ear here you're seeing and Philinus lintius, which is a, a beautiful yellow conch that, that is being sold now and, and cultivated. Cancer treatment, um, more studies show that turkey tail are the number one studied mushroom for extending life, for, for, for promoting healthy immunity during chemo or other medical treatments. For, and if you don't want to use medical treatments, uh, corporate medical treatments, then you could, I would certainly, the first mushroom I would add would be lots and lots, three grams of turkey tail powder twice per day or three times a day. 
uh, make your own is certainly a way to go if you really are going to take a lot of it. Rishi has some NI, has some studies showing that it extended people's lives when they're taking Rishi. And schizophilin or the split gill also has some studies for um, benefiting people with cancer. High blood sugar, we have the, as I mentioned, uh, Philinus lentius. This is Philinus lentius here. You can make an extract out of that. You can use jelly fungi, wood ear, or witch's butter. Can, can help control blood sugar and insulin release. Certainly, uh, any kind of oyster mushrooms, they come in blue, they come in, in dark gray, they come in yellow, they come in pink. Uh, so oyster mushrooms can be very good for regulating cholesterol and blood sugar. Heart disease, number one, reishi. Use that regularly, regularly as a dietary supplement along with hawthorn. Hawthorn leaf and flower. Use a, a powder of that. Shiitake also can help um, reduce cholesterol and oyster mushrooms as well. So those are all kind of shown to benefit cardiovascular system. Immune suppression, tricky tail, reishi. People ask me, well, what should I start with? My, uh, my immune system's run down, I wanna protect myself. It's always gonna be reishi, turkey tail because it contained by far the highest level of beta-glucan and immunomodulation compounds. Lift your mood. <clears throat> We've got uh, lion's mane, which has some clinical research on it. It's rather limited, small trials, but showing that it helped people lift depression. Again, a double extraction, even a tincture or a powder. Uh, also, cordyceps militaris. Never buy a product that contains cordyceps sinensis on the label, the original one, because it isn't. It isn't cordyceps sinensis. They're too expensive. So always get products that contain cordyceps militaris. Plus, they're beautiful. Plus, they're, they're domestically cultivated organically. And uh, you can get a lot of fruiting body, and it's not that expensive. Also, reishi, of course. Reishi, I found reishi is a very good one to lift your mood. Shiitake, I'm just going to show you these really quickly. There's a shiitake, beautiful, cultivated, uh, so many beneficial effects. You can review this PowerPoint again if you want to. I know it's being recorded. Also on YouTube, you can go to my YouTube channel. I have, I have a similar uh, slides to this that's available on YouTube. Um, clinical trials, yes. Um, uh, Chaga, really famous for anti-cancer effects and for its antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects. There's a Chaga there. Stabilizes blood sugar. Good for ulcers. Good for really good for ulcers. Chaga products. There, here's to how to make the Chaga product. But there are many products. You go on to eBay and type in chaga. You can buy bags of, of crushed chaga and they'll tell you how to use it, how to prepare it for ulcers and other things. Uh, Maitake for regulating blood sugar and it's also delicious. Here's Cordyceps sinensis, the original one, caterpillar and a fruiting body. These are not available. They are available, but if you bought three or four of those, that's a hundred bucks. So they, anything that says uh, opiocordyceps or cordyceps sinensis on the label, forget it. Don't buy it. You don't know what's in there. Only buy products that say cordyceps militaris. There's cordyceps militaris. That's cultivated. That has very similar benefits to, <clears throat> to the original um, cordyceps. All kinds of beneficial effects that have been shown anti-aging, convalescing from diseases, immunosuppression, really good for bronchial and lung inflammation, asthma. That's how it's used in China, bronchodilation. Another thing about, about um, cordyceps, it's one of the only proven natural medicines to really help support your kidneys. <clears throat> so for nephrotoxicity, if you're taking a drug that's nephrotoxic, go for the cordyceps. Three, three grams twice daily of a powder. Nephrotoxicity in elderly patients particularly. 
Here's the schizophilum, which is well proven as an anti-cancer remedy that's used widely as a food in Indonesia and India. High protein, delicious tasting, and small. Uh, schizophilum, lots of biological effects. Uh, honey mushroom, again, really good for epilepsy and, and a good tasting. Some people are allergic, are kind of sensitive to it. Look at that fruiting, what do you think? Fantastic, this was taken in the, the um, in Fort Bragg Botanical Garden. Fort ba Bragg Botanical Garden, right there as you're going in from Mendo to Fort Bragg on the left. This was taken right there in the garden on a stump. They sure are beautiful, but they're really good when they're young and, and I like that. In, in the, not in the button stage, but <clears throat> excuse me, not too expanded. <clears throat> uh, honey mushroom, yeah, and it can regulate cholesterol. Good for for epilepsy, leg pain, spasms, night vision, uh, insomnia. They, these are how it's used in in China, and there are some clinical trials that show benefits for hypertension and nerve weakness. Here is a gastrodia Chinese herb that that grows in, it's an orchid that grows in conjunction with honey mushroom. So it's a very famous and expensive Chinese uh, herb that they couldn't cultivate it. Then they found you have to have honey mushrooms growing with it to be able to cultivate it. And then they found that it was actually the, the fungus that produced the active compounds, not the orchid. The orchid maybe produced a few of them, but it's mainly the honey mushroom. So now they sell honey mushroom as Tian Ma. Pretty interesting. Here's more on it. <clears throat> Almond scented mushroom, really great. Uh, has cancer support, uh, liver benefits. You can find a lot of these in, in uh, Chinese uh, herb shops. You'll, you'll see jars and jars of them. They really like them over there. Wood ear, one of my all time favorites. This is taken in the Amazon. This is the log that was just so full of wood here, I couldn't believe it. Jelly fungi. They're edible and they're delicious, and they have good benefits as well. Red belted polypore, probably seen those on Douglas fir. Those were used by the early American physicians called the eclectics for, all, for neuralgia, nervous headaches, to benefit the liver, and so forth. Uh, here is the Fomies officinalis. Now it's called Larissa Fomies officinalis. Didn't change it there. The ancients knew of it. Here's a really long one, a really old one, puts on layers of tubes each year and was known to the Greeks. It was used for counteracting malaria, parasites, toxins, and so forth. There it is there. And thanks for watching. So we still have a few minutes. <clears throat> if there are any questions, I'm going to stop sharing my my screen here, uh, if I can get out of it, out of this. Um, there we go, got out of that. And let me get rid of this. Um, uh, get my, get it back here. Um, not sorry, I'm not getting to the, oh, there it is, okay. Oh, hey, okay. Chris. Chris, this is JR. I'm going to moderate the questions uh, from the uh, audience here. But uh, before we take questions, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, I think I'll uh, we'll go bet uh, alternate between the chat and um, and the audience if anybody has any questions here. So, okay. uh, so good. let's see. Um, how important, uh, so someone here asked, how important is it to use organic mushrooms? Well, if you can get wild ones, then you don't, you know, you're not picking them next to the freeway or a chemical plant, then I guess you don't need organic. you got organic, but, but I, you know, do you want to buy non-organic shiitake or button mushrooms, or do you want to grow, do you want to buy organic? Well, organic's more expensive. I would buy organic. Um, if you buy from a Chinese herb shop, 
none of them are going to be organic probably you don't know what they're how they're fumigated you don't i mean not, you can buy bags and bags of shiitake wood ear everything in a chinese grocery store but you know are they fumigated to prevent the bugs from eating them are they you know where are they grown so i mean i, I would prefer organic but if, if you're on a budget and you want to not buy organic then then the, the ones that grow on wood are going to be better so non-organic reishi is probably going to be okay because they don't yeah, they don't i don't think they have to really spray it much and it's growing on wood not on the ground so I would tend to turkey tail and cultivated and reishi. I wouldn't be as concerned about non-organic. Yes, Wayne. Um, I was retiring a lion's mane grow bag yesterday. And when I cut the bag away, there was like a one inch thick layer of lion's mane mat, I'll call it. How useful is that in producing this kind of powder Oh, it's great. I would never throw it away. I would cut away the mat and treat it just like the fruiting body. They're better off having mycelium plus fruiting body with lion's mane because lion's mane, <coughs> the, the fruiting body produces one type of diterpene and mycelium produces another type and they're, it's better to have both if you can. Uh, now, if the lion's mane is grown on, sometimes they grow it on sawdust, so they put some wood in there, because they in the wild they grow on wood. Uh, so, so I'd be, uh, you know, if but I would cut away the mat and I would use that. But if it was grown on rice, of course you could grind up, and there was a lot of mycelium in there. You could use the whole block. But I think with lion's mane, just cut the mat off and use that. Okay, Chris, uh, Madeline asks uh, about growing edibles on redwood stumps. No. <laughs> Simple answer. <laughs> I'll do it. Okay. Uh, Paul, you have a question? Oh, looks like Paul's left. So Paul has a question about, um, let's see, um, preparing witch's butter for eating. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blink. <laughs> If you're going to cook it, don't blink because it's gone. But, uh, you know, usually when you dry it, it, have you ever dried witch's butter or fond dried? It's like condenses and it gets very, very hard. Uh, it's like gelatin or something that's been really hard. And you can re-soak that and put it in soups. And, and that's done in Chinese med uh, cuisine and food and so forth. But if you got fresh, you, you know, just eat it fresh or just, you know, cook it a little bit and eat it fresh. I eat it right out in the woods fresh and don't mind it. I, I don't, I've never gotten an upset stomach from it. It's pretty easy to digest, but if you're going to dry it and store it, then just rehydrate it, put it in your soups. It, it may be, it may dissolve. I don't know if you, if it gets cooked for a while, it's going to probably dissolve, but that's okay. You'll still get the nutrients in the medicine. Kurt. Two part question. First okay. Part. First part, thanks so much a few years ago for donating a copy of your newest book at that time to our library. Uh, would you consider donating your newest book now that you just came out? To our sure. I'm going to be at the fair. I'm going to do a medicinal mushroom table. I'm going to be putting it up, and I'll be there to answer questions, and I'll also have books for sale, signed books for sale. Cool. Part two. That was, that was the first question. Second question, I was, after many years of looking, I finally, a few months ago, found an agaricon on a tree in an old growth forest in Oregon. Uh, estimated to be probably, it's got about 13 or 14 layers on it. And um, would you, if I decided to make powder out of that, do the same thing as the other mushrooms as, as well? You could. Yeah. <clears throat> taste it raw though, it's really interesting because it's got so many different flavors in there. You can taste sour, sweet, bitter. Uh, it's really interesting flavor when you take a little bit of that a context and, and put it in your mouth. Uh, yeah, I would boil it. I would, I would boil it. You could put it in a pressure cooker. It's got some, some really fascinating compounds in there for anti-parasitic, uh, anti-parasitic and 
It was also widely used for any type, counteracting any type of toxin or poison. It was used for opening up the bowels. Uh, it's not really a laxative, but it really does kind of open up your bowels. Uh, for cleansing, for, so for cleansing, uh, you can use it. Uh, it and and the, the ancients really liked it. And if you want to go on to, I'll put it in the chat here, you can actually go on the website, um, our, our website, uh, and it's called World Herb Library. Dot, uh, dot org. This is a this is a project that I'm doing. I have seven thousand books. My friends got seven thousand books, including a lot of mushroom books, old books back to the 1500s, 1600s. Well, look at the. I'm going to put in here the Gerard's Herbal. Uh, we have a Gerard's Herbal that you can search uh, in modern English. And you can actually just search for a Garicon, uh, and, and you can find it in there, and you can read how it was used in ancient times and all throughout the Renaissance. I'll no, let me, I'll let me send it. Because I know a lot of people have never seen one. I'm sorry, what did you say? You can bring it to the fair and put it on the table, because I know a lot of people have never seen one. Oh, yeah, a lot of people, yeah, oh, good, that'd be great. Uh, and in the Santa Cruz Fungus Fair, I had some great big ones that David Aurora bequeathed to me. Um, and they, I don't know if they're still in the box or not, because we didn't, we haven't done the fair for a few years. We are, I am giving a talk on Sunday uh, live at the Fungus Fair, uh, and, and then, uh, oh, Saturday, and then hopefully Sunday at SOMA, I'm going to be doing the talk. Alive, so I, I'll I'll have some samples there too. But I will bring all kinds of samples to the table. Uh, but if you have an agaricon, that would be awesome. So Mary asks about uh, the benefits of uh, fruiting body versus uh, mycelium, as long as the mycelium doesn't have the the starch substrate. Right, uh, mycelium plus fruiting body. The fruiting body tends to have about 20, 30% more, or maybe a little bit more even of the beta-glucans than the mycelium. But the beta-glucans are more easily absorbed and more bioavailable in the mycelium. So it ends up being kind of a wash. So to me, fruiting body and mycelium are pretty equal in their benefits. But the caveat, like you brought up, is that if the mycelium is grown on a substrate like brown rice and there's still a lot of brown rice in there, they didn't let the mycelium completely digest the substrate, you're going to have a lot of starch. That's why you use the starch test with iodine. Again, I show you how to do it in my book, but it's real easy. Always test your products. You're buying lion's mane, you're buying different products, test it with the iodine solution. It's very easy to do, and if it turns bright blue and stays bright blue, you know there's a fair amount of starch in there. So the mycelium and fruiting body, that's not the question. Uh, they're both equal if you've got pure mycelium and you've got pure fruiting body, but unfortunately, a lot of mycelium is gonna have, yeah, the substrate in it. So you have to be careful with that. You have to test it. Uh, yes. Oh, you, uh, Wayne, go ahead. I'm going to follow up my first question. You probably answered it, but I didn't catch it. Is that thick, spongy mat at the top of the lion's mane bag, grow bag, on the inside of the plastic, is that fruiting body or is that mycelium? It, it, if you can't see the individual threads, it's probably fruiting body that just flattened out against the side. If you can see the individual strands, maybe even under a hand lens, and it's probably mycelium, but I think it was more likely to be fruiting body yeah, on the outside of the bag. It's thick and spongy, literally like a thug. Yeah, probably fruiting body. Okay, um, Madeline, uh, oh, sorry, Paul asked about the standard recommended dos dosage of Reishi. It would be <clears throat> of a powder, an extract powder, it's gonna be one teaspoon is a maintenance dose, just like I put one teaspoon every morning, maybe a slightly heaping teaspoon in my matcha every morning. That's my main drink so during the cold and flu season. 
to maintain my, mus my immune system. And then if you have something like an active infection or even cancer or something, then you're gonna up the dose to one teaspoon twice a day, that's about six grams. One teaspoon should be about three grams or even three teaspoons. If you've got, you know, you're dealing with cancer or something like that, I'd really up it and I'd mix the, the Reishi and the turkey tail together and I'd be taking teaspoons three times a day. That should be enough. Okay, uh, we just have a couple more questions and then we'll uh, end it. So uh, Madeline asks about uh, the best way to farm mushroom or is gathering the best? <laughs> is it better to farm it or gather or in the wild? Was that yeah, it? Yeah, so it's on the chart, on the chat there. I'm, oh. So uh, yeah, I guess what Madeline is asking is, what's your opinion? Would you rather go out hunting or uh, would you rather grow them? Um, I, you know, both are good, but you're not always going to be able to find mushrooms out there. Uh, if, you know, like with oyster mushrooms, okay, there's a short window, they're going to be available. October, November, whatever, part of the, part of the fall, winter, uh, they're only going to be available then. You can, they don't dry that well. Uh, you can cook them and freeze them, uh, but, but uh, so growing them is going to give you a constant supply. And if you learn, really learn how to grow it on straw, it's pretty cheap to grow them. You can get poly tubes, you can, you can, you know, pressure cook it lightly or just put, or boil it slightly, spread, uh, strain it, squeeze it out till it's just slightly, till it's moist but not wet, and spread it out and then, and then put your spawn in there, mix it all in and then pack a poly tube with it, cut your, your crosses in and around it, and you can grow a lot of fruiting bodies very cheaply and very inexpensively. Uh, you could have three or four of those going, you'd have all the fruiting bodies you need. Uh, but, but buying them, I mean, if you, you know, if you feel like buying them, you can buy them. There's organic out there, far west fungi or whatever. Um, but, um, you know, I think, so there, there's advantages and disadvantages to both getting them from the wild. You, there are just some mushrooms you can't cultivate, like porcini, like chanterelle. You can't cultivate them. So if you want to get them, I heard, I read an article that somebody had started to have a little success with porcini, cultivating porcini. But, you know, for the most part, you're, they're just not available cultivated. And you're going to have to pick them from the wild and you're going to have to dry them and so forth. So th there's advantage and disadvantages. I don't think one's better than the other. And of course, uh, you're more likely to get your steps in if you uh, go out hunting. Ah, there you go. Uh, okay, last question. Um, uh, Madeline asked, uh, uh, sorry, Paula asked about uh, the process for um, uh, creating reishi broth. Yeah, you can just boil them and take the, you know, I, I take a pair of shears like, like Belco's or something and cut up the fruiting body if it's dried, uh, simmer it for an hour, uh, strain out the broth, and, and that's the broth that you use for making soups or stews or whatever. Uh, or if you want to put it in a pressure cooker and then blend it up and then put, and even put that in, that's going to be more fiber, that's going to be more beta glucan. You're getting a lot more out of that than just making a tea, uh, but but just store it in a canning jar, put it in the refrigerator, pour it into your soups or whatever. Um, so that would be your broth. But if you don't like the fiber and and reishi, you have to be careful because some growers, depending on the species, yeah, it could be quite bitter. So make sure to check the the fruiting body to begin with. If it's super bitter, you're not going to you want to use that as broth stock. Uh, so either way, either uh, pressure cooking it, blending it, storing that uh, in the refrigerator and using that, pouring that in there, that's what I would do because you just get so much more medicine. But if you just want a broth, just boil the mush, cut the mushrooms up, boil them, uh, strain the liquid off. And a uh, turkey tail would make a good broth because they taste like cream of mushroom soup. So you can't really go wrong with that. All right, thank you so much, uh, Chris, and uh, we'll see you at the Fungus Fair. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks for coming, everybody, and I'll see you at the fair.